Good morning and uh, welcome once again and a happy new year to you if I've not had the chance to wish you that so far uh, in uh, January. Uh, it's getting quite late for happy new year isn't it but um, nevertheless why not. Uh, and uh, of course we've still got the Christmas lights up here in the Suster household uh, to uh, try and um, uh, brighten our home uh, during lockdown too. Um, You'll know by now that we're looking at the subject of prayer over the next few weeks here on these um, online services uh, and uh, looking particularly at four prayers and the prayers and the situations in which those prayers were made. And we're seeking to see what we can learn from these prayers uh, for our own prayer lives as individuals and for our prayer life as a church. The prayer we're looking at this morning has already been uh, read to us. Uh, it's the prayer of one of the great kings of Judah named Hezekiah, and his prayer is a cry to God in a time of huge national crisis for Judah, when the country's been invaded by a vast army uh, and the city of Jerusalem is under very, very real threat. There's quite a, a significant uh, kind of backstory to this prayer, so you'll have to bear with me uh, as we take, us, uh, take this sort of the journey with um, Hezekiah and the people of, uh, of Judah, uh, through this situation to, to reach this moment where Hezekiah brings this situation to the living God. Uh, but um, it's really good to understand just how serious uh, this situation was. Hezekiah is commended as being a really good king for Judah. In fact, he was the best of the kings of Judah. Uh, in 2 Kings 18 verses 5 and 6, this is what we read about him. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all of the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. In his desire to follow the ways of the Lord, Hezekiah actually also wanted to break some of the alliances that his rather wayward father had made uh, before Hezekiah came to the throne. And the main one of these was with the kingdom, the powerful kingdom of Assyria, based in the city of Nineveh, some five or six hundred miles to the northeast. And so in the next verse we read this in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, verse 7. And the Lord was with him, he was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. This was actually quite a bold move because not uh, many years before Hezekiah took to the throne, uh, the the uh, kingdom of Assyria had attacked and completely routed the land of Israel just to the north, their immediate neighbour to the north. This great army had captured the city of Samaria and taken the people of the city and the people of that land far, far away into captivity. It would be some years, fortunately, before Assyria sort of roused itself again. Uh, but when Sennacherib uh, succeeded his father as king, he began to turn his attention once again towards the rebellious lands of the south that had turned rather to Egypt for their protection. And so it is this mighty Assyrian army is mobilised and begins a relentless march south. Their first conquest was the great uh, coastal city of Tyre and the inland town of Uzu. Both of these were important uh, thriving centres of trade and commerce for the whole of the region. But they were so utterly devastated and destroyed by the Assyrian onslaught that they never ever regained their, their sort of uh, prominence, their commercial prominence in the region ever again. And then the army continued south through the land of the Philistines. This map shows us how the, ma how the, uh, the army progressed. Uh, the city of El Teke, uh, Sennacherib's forces meet the Egyptian army called in at Hezekiah's request. Uh, a great army shown here coming up from the south, this sort of red arrow. Uh, rising up to meet uh, the Assyrian army. And this Egyptian army is strengthened by bowmen, chariots and cavalry from Ethiopia, surely a match for this Assyrian uh, crowd. Nevertheless, the Assyrians take the city, scoring yet another great victory. But then rather going after the fleeing Egyptians, Sennacherib chooses to return east once again and continue his assault on Judah. Meanwhile, part of the Assyrian army has been dispatched to attack Jerusalem and the land of Judah from the north, uh, shown on this map in these, uh, these green arrows. And on its way, it will capture the cities of northern Judah, in particular Ramah, 
which effectively cut off Mizpah, which was the anchor of Hezekiah's northern defences. Jerusalem was being methodically isolated by an unstoppable force of destruction. While this was going on, Sennacherib's other army, directed by the king himself, set about storming the strong cities and walled forts in the southwest of Judea. And the key to this area was the, uh, the Judean city of Lachish, one of the most strongly fortified cities in Hezekiah's kingdom. If this city could be taken, then Sennacherib could also begin to move through Judea, once again from the south, taking city after city, as the second army also then headed towards Jerusalem. The hope was, the hope and the prayer was, that Lachish would hold, that this great city would cause Sennacherib's march to pause, to falter, and hopefully to peter out. Uh, but no, news reaches Hezekiah, Lachish has fallen. The fall of Lachish must have been a, a, a massive blow to Hezekiah and the people seeking refuge with him in Jerusalem. If Sennacherib could take Lachish, what hope was there for Jerusalem? And by this time, the Assyrian army coming from the north had surrounded uh, Jerusalem. And there's a passage in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18, verses 19 to 25, where the field commander leading this army is taunting the people seeking to guard and protect Jerusalem standing up on the walls of the city and these are the words of this field commander he says tell Hezekiah this is what the great king the king of Assyria says on what are you basing this confidence of yours you say you have strategy and military strength but you speak only empty words on whom are you depending that you rebel against me Look now, you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. How could Jerusalem possibly hold out, not just against the Assyrian army amassed before them, but in the knowledge that the army that has successfully defeated, defeated Lachish, the second great fortress of Judah, is also probably on its way? Can we begin to see the desperate, hopeless position that Hezekiah and the remnants of Judah are facing? Where can they turn? Who will rescue them? What possible alternatives is there to, to surrender? Captivity and total destruction of Jerusalem, this last great city of Judah. It seems that this, this great stronghold, uh, their hiding place, was no longer a place of shelter, a place of safety, but a place of entrapment from which there would be no escape. So what did Hezekiah do? There was only one thing left to do, to turn to the Lord. The God whose temple he had reopened and reconsecrated some 14 years earlier at the beginning of his reign. What a great move, Hezekiah. And so 2 Kings chapter 19 begins with Hezekiah going to the temple of the Lord and sending for Isaiah the prophet to seek the counsel of God from the prophet of God. Isaiah's response is wonderfully encouraging to Hezekiah. We read this in 2 Kings 19 verses 6 and 7. Isaiah said to him, tell your master... This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I'm going to put such a spirit in him that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and there I will have him cut down by the sword. This is what Hezekiah needs to hear. And as we read on in verse 8 of 2 Kings 19, we find that the Assyrian army seems to be departing. They're leaving. Could this be the fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy? Maybe they will be spared after all. Maybe Sennacherib has had a change of heart and is on his way back to Nineveh. But then Hezekiah gets a rather unwelcome letter. 
It seems that Sennacherib has really not given up on Jerusalem at all. It's really not good news. This is what the great Sennacherib writes in 2 Kings 19 verses 10 to 13. Do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely, and you will be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Reseph, and the people of Eden, who were at Tel Asar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, or Hena, or Ivar? As Hezekiah ponders this letter from this great Assyrian king, he has some choices to make. Would he allow fear once again to take a hold? Would he give in to doubt the word of the prophet Isaiah about uh, Sennacherib's fate, that God had actually already sealed Sennacherib's fate? Indeed, that isn't what Hezekiah did. And then we read in 2 Kings 19 verses 14 and 15, and at last we come to this great prayer of Hezekiah, this is his prayer before the Lord God. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. O Lord God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Sennacherib's letter made it clear that he was picking a fight not just with Hezekiah and the kingdom of Judah, but with the living God himself. Sennacherib was likening the Lord God to the idols and images of the nations around them. Big, big mistake. And so we have this picture of Hezekiah laying out this great challenge, presenting this letter before the living God. Not some minor deity, some local God, just of Jerusalem or Judea, but the God who has made the heavens and the earth. The God over Assyria, Egypt and all of creation. Not a God created by the hands of men, carved in wood or cast in gold, but the living God. This is a God who could never be carried away into captivity by Sennacherib but a God who reigns supreme in the heavens. As Hezekiah prays, it seems he's picturing uh, the Ark of the Covenant within the Holy of Holies, just a few uh, yards away from him in the temple. The presence of God between the rings, the, uh, the wings of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies. And so Hezekiah continues this wonderful prayer. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. This was a prayer Hezekiah could pray in the firm knowledge that there was a world of difference. In fact, there was a, there's more than a universe of difference between the gods of the nations that Sennacherib was comparing the living God to and the living God himself. Hezekiah's God, the Lord, could see, hear and act. There's a great passage in the book of Isaiah, this uh, wonderful prophet uh, living with Hezekiah in the same city of Jerusalem during this time. Uh, and this is what um, Isaiah writes about these idols, these images. This is from Isaiah 46 uh, verses 5 to 7. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? These are the words of the living God. To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. And so Hezekiah completes his prayer in 2 Kings 19 verses 17 to 19. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now 
Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. What's the result of Hezekiah's prayer? How does God respond? Firstly, there is this wonderful further prophecy from Isaiah. Uh, this is too long to read uh, this morning, but I tell you what, it makes a wonderful reading. Uh, and you can read it in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 21 to 34. A wonderful passage, this great rebuke to uh, this supposedly vast army uh, around uh, Jerusalem. But more importantly, we read this in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 35 and 36. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Wise move. Sadly, later to be murdered by his sons, as God had, as uh, Isaiah had um, has prophesied. What can we learn from this great prayer of Hezekiah? I'm sure there is much we can learn. Perhaps about how he prayed, the way he began his prayer, by focusing on the living God rather than on the problem. Uh, the same way that Jesus taught us to pray in that, uh, that wonderful prayer he taught his disciples. Uh, teaching us to begin, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. We begin by uh, focusing on the living God ourselves in our prayers. But the one simple thought I want to leave you with from this prayer as we come to a close this morning is this. We have a God who hears, who sees, who knows, who acts. The great mystery and the wonder of prayer is that we simple, fallible, flawed human beings can, through prayer, see heaven moved, battles won and lives transformed, including our own. Amen.